Abiogenesis. The third part. This sound file contains the spoken version of a Wikipedia article on Abiogenesis. You are listening to the third part. The third part begins now. Abiogenesis. From Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at en.wikipedia.org. Section 4. Current Models Most currently accepted models draw at least some elements from the framework laid out by the operand Haldane hypothesis. Under that umbrella, however, are a wide array of discoveries and postulations. Some theorists suggest that the atmosphere of the early Earth may have been chemically reducing in nature, composed primarily of methane, ammonia, water, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide, and phosphate, with molecular oxygen and ozone either rare or absent. In such a reducing atmosphere, electrical activity can accelerate chemical change or catalyze the creation of certain basic small molecules, monomers of life, such as amino acids. This was demonstrated in the Miller-Urey experiment. Phospholipids of an appropriate length can form lipid bilayers, a basic component of the cell membrane. Since replication is accompanied in the modern cells through the cooperative action of proteins and nucleic acids, the major schools of thought about how the process originated can be broadly classified as proteins first, end quote, and, quote, nucleic acids first, end quote. In the, quote, nucleic acids first, end quote, argument, the Polymerization of nucleotides into random RNA molecules might have resulted in self-replicating ribosomes, the RNA world hypothesis. Ribosomes are the site of protein manufacture. Selection pressures for catalytic efficiency and diversity might have resulted in ribosomes forming small proteins. The first ribosome might have been created by such a process, resulting in more prevalent protein synthesis. Then, synthesized proteins might then outcompete ribosomes in catalytic ability, and therefore become the dominant bipolymer, regulating nucleic acids to their modern use, predominantly as a carrier of genomic information. No one has synthesized a, quote, proto-cell, end quote, using basic components which would have the necessary properties of life, the so-called bottom-up approach. However, some researchers are working in this field, notably Steen Rasmussen at Los Alamos National Laboratory and Jack Stostak at Harvard University. Others have argued that a top-down approach is more feasible. One such approach, successfully attempted by Craig Venter and others at the Institute for Genomic Research, involves engineering existing prokaryotic cells with progressively fewer genes, attempting to discern at which point the most minimal requirements for life were reached. The biologist John Desmond Bernal suggested that there were a number of clearly defined, quote, stages, end quote, that could be recognized in explaining the origin of life. Stage one, the origin of biological monomers. Stage two, the origin of biological polymers. And stage three, the evolution from molecules to cells. Renal suggested that evolution might have commenced early, sometime between stage 1 and 2. Monomer Formation 
One of the most important pieces of experimental support for the soup theory came in 1953. The now famous Miller-Urey experiment provided direct experimental support for the second point of the, quote, soup, end quote, theory. And it is around the remaining two points of the theory that much of the debate now centers. Apart from the Miller-Urey experiment, the next most important step in research on prebiotic organic synthesis was the demonstration by the biochemist Joan Oral that the nucleic acid purine base, adenine, was formed by heating aqueous ammonium cyanide solutions. In support of abiogenesis in eutectic ice, more recent work demonstrated the formation of alternative nucleobases, as well as cytosine and uracil, and adenine from solutions subjected to freeze-thaw cycles under a reductive atmosphere with spark discharges as an energy source. Biochemist Robert Shapiro has summarized the primordial soup theory of Operin and Haldane in its, quote, mature form, end quote, as follows. The early Earth had a chemically reducing atmosphere, and this atmosphere, exposed to energy in various forms, produced simple organic compounds, monomers. These monomers accumulated in a soup, which may have been concentrated at various locations, shorelines oceanic vents, etc. By further transformation, more complex organic polymers, and ultimately life, developed in the soup. The spontaneous formation of complex polymers from abiotically generated monomers under the conditions posited by the soup theory is not at all a straightforward process. Besides the basic organic monomers, compounds that would have prohibited the formation of polymers were formed in high concentration during the Miller-Urey experiment and experiments by Joan Oral. The Miller experiment, for example, produces many substances that would undergo cross-reactions with the amino acids or terminate the peptide chain. More fundamentally, it can be argued that the most crucial challenge unanswered by this theory is how the relatively simple organic building blocks combine or polymerize and form more complex structures, interacting in consistent ways to form a protocell. For example, in an aqueous environment, hydrolysis of monomers into Oligomers into polymers and polymers into their constituent monomers would be favored over the condensation of individual monomers into polymers. Reducing Atmosphere Whether the mixture of gases used in the Miller-Urey experiment truly reflects whether the mixture of gases used in the Miller-Urey experiment truly reflects the atmospheric content of early Earth is a controversial topic. Other less reducing gases produce a lower yield and variety. It was once thought that appreciable amounts of molecular oxygen were present in the prebiotic atmosphere, which would have essentially prevented the formation of organic molecules. However, the current scientific consensus is that such was not the case. The Deep Sea Vent Theory The Deep Sea Vent, or Hydrothermal Vent, theory for the origin of life on Earth posits that life may have begun as submarine hydrothermal vents where hydrogen-rich fluids emerge from below the sea floor and interface with carbon dioxide-rich ocean water. Sustained chemical energy in such systems 
is derived from redox reactions in which electron donors, such as molecular hydrogen, react with electron acceptors, such as carbon dioxide. Chemist Mike Russell demonstrated that alkaline vents created a chemical gradient in which conditions are ideal for an abiogenic hatchery for life. These microscopic compartments, quote, provide a natural means of concentrating organic molecules composed of iron sulfur minerals endowed by these mineral cells with the catalytic properties envisaged by Gunter Wachterschauser. Fox's Experiments In the 1950s and 1960s, Sidney W. Fox studied the spontaneous formation of peptide structures under conditions that might plausibly have existed early in Earth's history. He demonstrated that amino acids could spontaneously form small peptides. These amino acids and small peptides could be encouraged to form closed spherical membranes he called, quote, proteinoid microspheres, end quote, which show many of the basic characteristics of, quote, life, end quote. Egan's Hypothesis In the early 1970s, the problem of the origin of life was approached by Manfred Egan and Peter Schuster of the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry. They examined the transient stages between the molecular chaos and a self-replicating hypercycle in a prebiotic soup. In a hypercycle, the information storing system, possibly RNA, produces an enzyme which catalyzes the formation of another information system until the product of the last aids in the formation of the first information system. Mathematically treated, hypercycles could create quasi-species, which, through natural selection, entered into a form of Darwinian evolution. A boost to hypercycle theory was the discovery that RNA, in certain circumstances, forms itself into ribosomes capable of catalyzing their own chemical reactions. However, these reactions are limited to self-excisions, in which a longer RNA molecule becomes shorter, and much rarer small additions that are incapable of coding for any useful protein. The hypercycle theory is further degraded since the hypothetical RNA would require the existence of complex biochemicals such as nucleotides, which are not formed under the conditions proposed by the Miller-Urey experiment. Hoffman's Contributions Jeffrey W. Hoffman contributed to the concept of life involving both replication and metabolism emerging from catalytic noise. His contributions included showing that an early sloppy translation machinery can be stable against an error catastrophe of the type that had been envisaged as problematical by Leslie Orgel, Orgel's paradox and calculations regarding the occurrence of a set of required catalytic activities that would be disruptive. This is called the stochastic theory. Wachter Schauser's Hypothesis Deep Black Smoke Another possible answer to this polymerization conundrum was provided in the 1980s by the German chemist Gunter Wachter Schauser encouraged and supported by Karl R. Popper in his iron-sulfur world theory. In this theory, he postulated the evolution of biochemical pathways as fundamentals of the evolution of life. 
Moreover, he presented a consistent system of tracing today's biochemistry back to ancestral reactions that provide alternative pathways to the synthesis of organic building blocks from simple gaseous molecules. In contrast to the classical Miller experiments, which depend on external sources of energy, such as simulated lightning or ultraviolet irradiation, quote, Wachter Schauser's systems, end quote, come with a built-in source of energy, sulfites of iron and other minerals, for example, pyrite. The energy released from redox reactions of these metal sulfites is not only available for the synthesis of organic molecules, but also for the formation of oligomers and polymers. It is therefore hypothesized that such systems may be able to evolve into autocatalytic sets of self-replicating, metabolically active entities that would predate the life forms known today. The Radioactive Beach Hypothesis Zachary Adam at the University of Washington, Seattle, claims that stronger tidal processes from a much closer moon may have concentrated grains of uranium and other radioactive elements the high water mark on primordial beaches where they may have been responsible for generating life's building blocks. According to computer models, a deposit of such radioactive materials could show the same self-sustaining nuclear reaction as that found in the Oclo uranium ore seam in Gabon. Such radioactive beach sand provides sufficient energy to generate organic molecules such as amino acids and sugars. Radioactive monazite also releases soluble phosphate into regions between sand grains, making it biologically, quote, accessible, end quote. Thus, amino acids, sugars, and soluble phosphates can all be simultaneously produced, according to Adam. Radioactive actinides, then in greater concentrations, could have formed part of organometallic complexes. These complexes could have been important early catalysts to living processes. John Parnell of the University of Aberdeen suggests that such a process could provide part of the, quote, crucible of life, end quote, on any early wet rocky planet, so long as the planet is large enough to have generated a system of plate tectonics which brings radioactive materials to the surface. As the early Earth is believed to have had many smaller Quote, platelets, end quote, it would provide a suitable environment for such processes. Thermodynamic Origin of Life Entropy is a measure of the energy that is not available for work during a thermodynamic process because of thermodynamic variables such as temperature, pressure, or composition. Carol Michaelian of the National Autonomous University of Mexico points out that any model for the origin of life must take into account the fact that the life is an irreversible thermodynamic process which arises and persists to produce entropy. Entropy production is not incidental to the process of life, but rather the fundamental reason for its existence present-day life augments the entropy production of Earth by catalyzing the water cycle through evapotranspiration. Markelian argues that if the thermodynamic function of life today is to produce entropy through coupling with the water cycle, then this probably was its function at its early beginnings. It turns out that both RNA and DNA when in water solution, are very strong absorbers and extremely rapid dissipators of ultraviolet light, 
the high-energy part of the sun's spectrum, just that high-energy part of the sun's spectrum could have penetrated the dense prebiotic atmosphere. Nossin et al. have shown that the amount of ultraviolet, or UV, light reaching the Earth's surface in the Archean could have been up to 31 orders of magnitude larger than it is today, where RNA and DNA absorb most strongly. Absorption and dissipation of UV light by these organic molecules at the Archean ocean surface would have increased significantly the temperature of the surface skin layer, leading to enhanced evaporation, and thus augmenting the primitive water cycle. Since absorption and dissipation of high-energy photons is an entropy-producing process, Michaelian argues that non-equilibrium abiogenic synthesis of RNA and DNA utilizing UV light would have been thermodynamically favored. A simple mechanism to explain the replication of RNA and DNA without the use of enzymes can also be given within the same thermodynamic framework by assuming a temperature-assisted mechanism of replication that life arose when the temperature of the primitive seas had cooled to somewhat below the denaturing temperature of RNA or DNA. Denaturation means to treat a protein or the like by chemical or physical means so as to alter its original state. During night, the surface water temperature would be below the denaturing temperature, and single-strand RNA slash DNA could act as a template for the formation of double-strand RNA slash DNA. During the daylight hours, RNA and DNA would absorb UV light and convert this directly to heating of the ocean surface, raising the local temperature enough to allow for denaturing of RNA and DNA. The copying process would be repeated during the cool period overnight. Michaelian suggests that traditional origin of life research, expecting to describe the emergence of life from near equilibrium conditions, is erroneous, and that non-equilibrium conditions must be considered, in particular the importance of entropy production to the emergence of life. Since denaturation would be most probable in the late afternoon when the Archean sea surface temperature would be highest, and since late afternoon submarine sunlight is somewhat circularly polarized, the homochirality of the organic molecules of life can also be explained within the proposed thermodynamic framework. Models to explain homochirality the term chiral is used to describe an object that is non-superimposable on its mirror image. Human hands are perhaps the most universally recognized example of chirality. The left hand is a non-superimposable mirror image of the right hand. This difference in symmetry becomes obvious if someone attempts to shake the right hand of a person using his left hand or if a left-handed glove is placed on a right hand. The term homochirality refers to all building blocks of living organisms having the same handedness, or chirality, amino acids being left-handed, nucleic acid sugars, ribose and deoxyribose, being right-handed, and also chiral phosphoglycerides. Some processes in chemical evolution must account for the origin of homochirality, i.e., chiral molecules can be synthesized, but in the absence of a chiral source or a chiral catalyst, they are formed in a 50-50 mixture of both enantiomer, the pair of optical isomers that are mirror images of each other. This is called a racemic mixture. Racemism is the state of being optically inactive and separable into two other substances of the same chemical composition as the original substance. 
it has been suggested that homochirality may have started in space, as the studies of the amino acids on the Murchison meteorite showed. It is suggested that polarized light has the power to destroy one enantiomer within the protoplanetary disk. Beta decay caused the breakdown of D-leucine in a racemic mixture, and thus the presence of carbon-14 present in larger amounts in inorganic chemicals in the early Earth environment could have been the cause. Chemist Robert M. Hazen reports upon experiments conducted in which various chiral crystal surfaces act as sites for possible concentration and assembly of chiral monomer units into macromolecules. Once established, chirality would be selected for. Studies of organic compounds found on meteorites tend to suggest that chirality is a characteristic of abiogenic synthesis as amino acids show a left-handed bias, whereas sugars show a predominantly right-handed bias. Self-Organization and Replication While features of self-organization and self-replication are often considered the hallmark of living systems, there are many instances of abiotic molecules exhibiting such characteristics under proper conditions. For example, Martin and Russell showed that physical compartmentation by cell membranes from the environment and self-organization of self-contained redox reactions are the most conserved attributes of living things, and they argue, therefore, that inorganic matter with such attributes would be life's most likely last common ancestor. Virus self-assembly within host cells has implications for the study of the origin of life as it lends further credence to the hypothesis that life could have started as self-assembling organic molecules. From Organic Molecules to Protocells Researcher Martin Hansik supports the idea of a gradient between life and non-life i.e., there is no simple line between the two. He thinks that building simple protocells in the lab is one of the first steps toward understanding more complex cells, including those that may have later evolved into complex life. Hansik says that living cells often consist of somewhere around one million types of molecules whereas his labs are first aiming at creating lifelike systems using around 10 molecules. His protocells display behaviors even simpler than those displayed by things like viruses. For example, only basic motion, dividing and combining cell walls, and so on. The RNA World Hypothesis the RNA world hypothesis describes an early Earth with self-replicating and catalytic RNA, but no DNA or proteins. This has spurred scientists to try to determine if relatively short RNA molecules that have spontaneously formed that were capable of catalyzing their own continuing replication. A number of hypotheses of modes of formation have been put forward. Early cell membranes could have formed spontaneously from proteinoids, protein-like molecules that are produced when amino acid solutions are heated. When present at the correct concentration in aqueous solution, these form microspheres, which are observed to behave similarly to membrane-enclosed compartments. Other possibilities include systems of chemical reactions taking place within clay substrates or on the surface of pyrite rocks. Factors supportive of an important role for RNA in early life include its ability to act both to store information and catalyze chemical reactions as a ribosome, its many important roles as an intermediate in the expression and maintenance of the genetic information, the form of DNA, in modern organisms, and the ease of chemical synthesis of at least the components of the molecule 
under conditions approximating the early Earth. Relatively short RNA molecules, which can duplicate others, have been artificially produced in the lab. Such replicase RNA, which functions as both code and catalyst, provides a template upon which copying can occur. Biologist Jack Zostak has shown that certain catalytic RNA can indeed join smaller RNA sequences together creating the potential in the right conditions for self-replication. If these were present, Darwinian selection would favor the proliferation of such self-catalyzing structures to which further functionalities could be added. An RNA enzyme capable of self-sustained replication has been identified. Researchers have pointed out difficulties for the abiotic synthesis of nucleotides from cytosine and uracil. Cytosine has a half-life of 19 days at 100 degrees Celsius, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, and 17,000 years in freezing water. A study by Lorald et al., 1995, say that, quote, the generally accepted prebiotic synthesis of ribose, the foremost reaction, yields numerous sugars without any selectivity, end quote. And they conclude that their, quote, results suggest that the backbone of the first genetic material could not have contained ribose or other sugars because of their instability, end quote. A slightly different version of the RNA world hypothesis is that a different type of nucleic acid such as PNA, TNA, or GNA, was the first one to emerge as a self-reproducing molecule to be replaced by RNA only later. Pyrimidine ribonucleosides and their respective nucleotides have been prebiotically synthesized by a sequence of reactions which bypass the free sugars and are assembled in a stepwise fashion. In a series of publications, the Sutherland Group at the School of Chemistry, University of Manchester, have demonstrated high-yielding routes to cytidine and iridine ribonucleotides built from small 2 and 3 carbon fragments. Chemist James Ferris's studies have shown that clay minerals of montmorillonite will catalyze the formation of RNA in aqueous solution by joining activated mono-RNA nucleotides to join together to form longer chains. Although these chains have random sequences, the possibility that one sequence began to non-randomly increase its frequency by increasing the speed of its catalysis is possible to, quote, kick-start, end quote, biochemical evolution. Metabolism First Models Several models reject the idea of the self-replication of a, quote, naked gene, end quote, and postulate the emergence of a primitive metabolism which could provide an environment for the later emergence of RNA replication. The Krebs cycle, or citric acid cycle, is a series of chemical reactions carried out in the living cell in most higher animals and is essential for the oxidative metabolism of glucose and other simple sugars. The centrality of the Krebs cycle to energy production in aerobic organisms and in drawing in carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions in biosynthesis of complex organic molecules, including amino acids and nucleotides, suggests that it was one of the first parts of the metabolism to evolve. Harold Morowitz concludes that given sufficient concentrations of ingredients, the cycle will, quote, spin, end quote, of its own. As the concentration of each intermediate rises, it tends to convert into the next intermediate spontaneously. It thus appears to be in origin, not a creation of the genes, but the product of thermodynamics and chemistry alone. Somewhat in agreement with these notions, physicist Sean Carroll has proposed that, quote, 
the purpose of life is to hydrogenate carbon dioxide, end quote. Iron Sulfur World One of the earliest incarnations of this idea was put forward in 1924 with Alexander Oppermann's notion of primitive self-replicating vesicles which predated the discovery of the structure of DNA. More recent variants in the 1980s and 1990s include Gunter Wachterschauser's Iron Sulfur World Theory and models introduced by Christian D. Duvet based on the chemistry of bioesters. More abstract and theoretical arguments for the plausibility of the emergence of metabolism without the presence of genes include a mathematical model introduced by theoretical physicist and mathematician Freeman John Dyson in the early 1980s and Stuart Kaufman's notion of collectively autocatalytic sets discussed later in that decade. However, the idea that a closed metabolic cycle, such as the reductive citric acid cycle, could form spontaneously, proposed by Wachterschauser, remains debated. In his article entitled, Self-Organizing Biochemical Cycles, Orgel summarized his analysis of the proposal by stating, quote, there is at present no reason to expect that multi-step cycles, such as the reductive citric acid cycle, will self-organize on the surface of iron sulfide or some other mineral, end quote. It is possible that another type of metabolic pathway was used at the beginning of life. Thermosynthesis World Thermosynthesis is a mechanism proposed by Anthony W. J. Muller making use of free energy from temperature gradients for thermodynamically unfavored anabolic reactions. Today's bioenergetic process of fermentation is related to the citric acid cycle, which has been connected to the primordial iron sulfur world. In a different approach, today's bioenergetic process of chemiosmosis the diffusion of ions across a selectively permeable membrane, which plays an essential role in cellular respiration and photosynthesis, is considered as more fundamental than fermentation. ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, is the organic compound that acts upon enzymes, or substrate, in many enzyme-catalyzed reactions in the cells of animals, plants, and microorganisms. ATP's chemical bonds store a large amount of chemical energy and functions as the carrier of chemical energy from energy-yielding oxidation of food to energy demanding cellular processes. ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, is the end product that results when ATP loses one of its phosphate groups located at the end of the molecule. The ATP synthase enzyme is an enzyme that can synthesize ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate by using some form of energy. The conversion of these two molecules play a critical role in supplying energy for many processes of life. In Muller's thermosynthesis world, the ATP synthase enzyme that sustains chemiosmosis is proposed as today's enzyme that is the closest connected to the first metabolic process. First, life needed an energy source to bring about the condensation reaction that yielded the peptide bonds of proteins and the phosphodiester bonds of RNA. In a generalization and thermal variation of the binding change mechanism of today's ATP synthase, the first protein would have bound substrates and condensed them to a reaction product that remained bound, until after a temperature change it was released by thermal unfolding. The energy source of the thermosynthesis world was thermal cycling the result of suspension of the protocell in a convection current, as is plausible in a volcanic hot spring. 
The convection accounts for the self-organization and dissipative structure required in any origin of life model. The still ubiquitous role of thermal cycling in germination and cell division is considered a relic of primordial thermosynthesis. By catalyzing cell membrane lipids, this first protein gave a selective advantage to the lipid protocell that contained the protein. In the beginning, this first protein also synthesized a library of many proteins, of which only a minute fraction had thermosynthesis capabilities. Just as proposed by Freeman John Dyson, the first protein propagated functionally. It made daughters with similar capabilities, but it did not copy itself. Functioning daughters consisted of different amino acids and sequences. It is assumed RNA sequences were selected among the randomly synthesized RNAs by the relative speed and efficiency increase of first protein synthesis. For instance, by the creation of RNA that functioned as messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and ribosomal RNA, or even more generally, all the components of the RNA world were also generated and selected. The thermosynthesis world would therefore, in theory, account for the origin of the genetic machinery. Whereas the iron-sulfur world identifies a circular pathway as the most simple, and therefore assumes the existence of enzymes, the thermosynthesis world does not even invoke a pathway and does not assume the existence of regular enzymes. ATP synthesis binding change mechanism resembles a physical absorption process that yields free energy rather than a regular enzyme's mechanism which decreases the free energy. The RNA world also implies the existence of several enzymes, but even the emergence of a single enzyme by chance is implausible. The thermosynthesis world is therefore more simple and thus more plausible than the iron, sulfur, and RNA worlds. Possible Role of Bubbles Waves breaking on the shore create a delicate foam composed of bubbles. Winds sweeping across the ocean have a tendency to drive things to shore, much like driftwood collecting on the beach. It is possible that organic molecules were concentrated on the shorelines in much the same way. Shallow, coast, shallow coastal waters also tend to be warmer, further concentrating the molecules through evaporation. While bubbles composed mostly of water burst quickly, water containing a chemical compound possessing both hydrophilic and hydrophobic properties, called amphiphiles, forms much more stable bubbles, lending more time to the particular bubble to perform these crucial reactions. Amphiphiles are oily compounds containing a hydrophilic head on one or both ends of a hydrophobic molecule. Some amphiphiles have, a, have the tendency to spontaneously form membranes in water. A spherically closed membrane contains water and is a hypothetical precursor to the modern cell membrane. If a protein would increase the integrity of its parent bubble, that bubble had an advantage. Primitive reproduction can be envisioned when the bubbles burst, releasing the results of the experiment into the surrounding medium. Once enough of the right stuff was released into the medium, the development of the first prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and multicellular organisms could be achieved. Similarly, bubbles formed entirely out of protein-like molecules called microspheres will form spontaneously under the right conditions, but they are not a likely precursor to the modern cell membrane as cell membranes are composed primarily of lipid compounds rather than amino acid compounds. A recent model suggests that the enclosure of an autocatalytic non-enzymatic metabolism within protocells 
may have been one way of avoiding the side reaction problem that is typical of metabolism first models. Possible role of pumice rafts. An alternative, or perhaps adjunct theory, to the formation of bubbles via waves breaking on the shore, creating delicate foam, is the hypothetical creation of bubbles formed within pores of a pumice raft. Like the wind-blown foam, the pumice rafts would also have made landfall, and this is observed in modern times. Paleoontological evidence of pumice rafts, associated with Archean life, have been discovered in Australia. Although the wind-blown concentration of organic molecules may have been a key part of the abiogenesis puzzle, even with amphiphilic stabilization, exposure to the elements may have rendered the fragile foam too unstable to be an abiogenesis precursor and slash or its ongoing natural selection factor. A possibly more probable bubble formation environment for the cradle of life to occur would have been the protected environment within the pores of the pumice. The crucial reaction time necessary could have been greatly extended in this protected environment. Relatively rapid selection pressure could have been applied if the pumice raft landed on active geothermal outgassing percolation, acting something like an airstone in an aquarium pumping out massive quantities of various bubble quasi-species, and then species probabilistically interacting and evolving. We now come to the end of the spoken article. Abiogenesis, Part 3 The next part of the recording, Part 4, contains Section 5, Other Models. This sound file, its text, and all the text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 unported license, available at http slash slash creativecommons.org slash licenses slash by hyphen sa slash 3.0